I always do this uh, experiment with the students that I, I meet. I say that, supposing uh, you are offered an air ticket to any part, uh, anywhere in the world, where would you go and why? Coming up later, Education Minister Chan Chun Singh tells us how he susses out if students have what it takes to compete for top jobs around the world. Hello, you're watching The Big Story with me, Chiao Su An. Subscribe to The Straits Times channel to stay up to date with our live news updates. In a moment, I'll interview with Education Minister Chan Chun Singh. But first, the news headlines. In the aftermath of Joseph Schooling's drug confession, German luxury fashion brand Hugo Boss says its support for the Olympic gold medalist remains strong. Hugo Boss says, and I quote, Joseph has made a mistake, but what's important is that he has taken ownership of it. Schooling became the brand's first Singaporean ambassador in 2018. Following Schooling's historic victory in the 100-metre butterfly at the 2016 Olympics, sponsors lined up to court him, with brands like Hugo Boss, Yakult, Canon, Tag Heuer and Milo inking deals with the swimmer. The Straits Times understands that most of the deals are valued at at least six figures each. Marketing experts whom ST spoke to said that what sponsors do following the drug revelations will depend on what schooling does in the aftermath and how Singaporeans react. Netizens' reactions to the news have been mixed. While some sympathise with his situation and call for a second chance to be given to him, others question if his social status has influenced the punishment he will receive. Joining us now is journalist Jean Yao. So Jean, you've spoken to some lawyers who have handled similar cases. We're hoping you could help us answer some questions. So far, schooling has been dealt with by the SAF, which has warned him and put him on a urine test regime. Are these typical measures for an NS man who has taken drugs overseas? And some netizens seem to think that he received special treatment. Is that fair? Well, I think it's quite crucial here that his urine test actually came back negative. So in terms of actual evidence that the SAF could have against him, it's only his confession. So I think, well, okay, the lawyers I talked to seem to think that that wouldn't be enough to lead to, lead to an actual conviction. So I think what Mindev said as well is that, you know, this is the standard protocol for everybody who confesses to taking drugs overseas. They put them on this six-month testing regime. Um, yeah, so I mean, if he did, if it did actually come back positive, then the lawyers all said that it would be quite clear cut nine months DB, which is the usual case for um, those who do test positive. So, what do you think is next for Joseph Schooling? I think it, it really depends on what comes from this six month testing. So, if for example, he, you know, if he stays clean throughout, then I think that would be it. But if it's if he does come back positive in any of his tests, which some of the lawyers said could be like a fully surprised test, like at any time of the day they could test him, uh, test his urine, I mean, then I think it's a different case. You know, he could definitely see, yeah, take the nine months in DB or be treated like anyone else, really. Yeah, any other NSF facing military law. Yeah. So it seems like he will receive the same kind of treatment as anybody else. But looking at the current situation, will he be convicted or have a criminal record of any kind? And also schooling tested negative during the first urine test, but confessed that he had taken drugs. Will that confession be a critical factor in the penalty he receives, whether now or in the future? Well, I think it will be quite... If he does in fact get convicted, which... I mean, based on what we know so far, it looks unlikely. It is quite a large mitigating factor because if you confess, you show genuine remorse, you show um, you know, a desire to want to rehabilitate. So I do think that's quite a large um, mitigating factor. And that's, oh, sorry, this is completely what the lawyers have told me as well. But um, yeah, so he, he has tested negative now. And the thing is, because there's no conviction, it won't lead to a criminal record. I think as well you have to consider that 
um, it depends on the court martial. So if the court martial directs the case to civilian criminal just to the criminal courts like outside the military law, then he will have a uh, criminal record. But if it stays under the, the SAF Act, then it doesn't lead to a criminal record. So, yeah. Thank you very much for answering our questions. This has been journalist Jean Yao. And in other news, if you use the Grab app to hail rides or order food, well, you will soon be able to take care of your banking needs as well. That's because Grab and Singtel are joining forces to roll out a new digital bank next week on September 5th. Called GXS, it will target Grab's customers who are mostly younger people and gig economy workers. To start off, the digital bank will be offering a savings account that requires no minimum deposits. It will also offer daily interest deposits that could amount up to 1.58% per annum. And good news if you've been looking forward to visiting Japan. Soon, you will no longer need to be part of a guided tour. Japan will allow non-guided package tours from all countries and it will more than double the number of people it allows to enter daily from 20,000 to 50,000 as it further eases COVID-19 border controls. This starting September 7th. The country currently has some of the strictest COVID-19 border measures among major economies. Tributes have been pouring in for the former Soviet president, Mikhail Gorbachev, who died at the age of 91. In a statement on the White House website, US President Joe Biden calls Gorbachev a man of remarkable vision who ended the Cold War. Similar sentiments were echoed by world leaders across the globe. Gorbachev is a Nobel Peace Prize winner and will be remembered for forging arms reduction deals with the United States and partnerships with Western powers that paved the way for the reunification of Germany. And the competition for global talent is fierce and increasing. On Monday, major changes to Singapore's Work Pass framework were announced, including the launch of a new Overseas Networks and Expertise Pass. The new pass is aimed at top foreign talent across all sectors. And it's one of the topics we've been discussing with Education Minister Chan Chun Singh, the man charged with preparing young Singaporeans for the jobs of the future. The Big Story's Harianto Demand spoke to Mr Chan and began by asking him if the one pass will be a game changer in helping Singapore attract the best and the brightest. Well, this is not a new challenge and I would say that this issue has been with us ever since 1965 when we first became independent. Because we are such a small country and every year we have a cohort of 30-40,000 uh, students and no matter how many good students we produce, it will be very small compared to the global talent pool. So we must never underestimate the competition. Uh, so regardless of how much talent we have, we must always remember that <coughs> we need to develop the local talent pool as much as we can and at the same time find the necessary complement for those areas that we might not be strong in at this point in time. But we also understand of course that you know, we, when talented people come here, uh, some people might be afraid that they might bring along with them competition, uh, uh, whether they are truly complementary. This is where we really need to juggle, right? Yeah. Of course, it's a bit, um, the answer is a bit <coughs> memorable because we know that it's not always possible for us to bring in an above average person who is always below the every Singaporean. So that's not entirely possible. Mm. So that's why we need a two-pronged strategy and we always have a two-pronged strategy firing on all cylinders. On the part of MOE, MOM, <coughs> MTI, we put in all the effort necessary to groom our students, not just in the early years of what I call the first 15 years of their life, but really to help them to keep growing for the next 50 years of their life beyond the school system. And that's how we want to strengthen the competitiveness of our people. But we are not arrogant, we are not complacent. We know that no matter how we do this, there will still be some people around the world with that kind of uh, unique talent that we might not have. Mm. And if possible, we would like to attract them to join T Team Singapore to complement what we don't have. Uh, otherwise, they would be competing against Singapore with some other teams rather than with us. So those are actually challenges that we have been grappling with ever since independence. How would you address any unhappiness that could arise you know, from Singaporeans who 
again, we know that with this move, it's to bring in the talents that we need, right? Uh, but at the same time also, you know, the idea of wooing foreign talents has always been met with scepticism and, um, you know, from certain quarters here that there are loopholes that may be exploited uh, by those looking to come in. So, you know, we just want to get from you, you know, how, how would you address those unhappiness that may come from Singaporeans, you know, with this uh, new One Pass uh, framework? I think every Singaporean can have the reassurance that the government will try to master the resources as much as we can, as well as we can, to give everyone a good start, making sure that through the school system, we lay the foundation for them to learn throughout life and that they remain competitive throughout life and not just uh, in the first 15 years. How do we structure our training system to keep our people competitive in the next 50 years of their life beyond the school years. And that is important because you can never finish learning everything in school. And Singaporeans can have the confidence that if any country can invest this amount of money to our adult learners, Singapore must be one of them. Mm. We have the means, we need the cooperation of the individuals, we need the cooperation of the companies, but together I think if any country can get this done, it must be us. But we need to change the mindset. It's not just about how well we produce uh, the students' results in the first 15 years, how well they score for whatever exams they might be. But it's really to lay the foundation on how they want to keep learning for the rest of their life. It's very difficult for adult learners to go back to school, what we call that going back to school, because they have financial responsibilities, they have family responsibilities. So we need to design a system whereby they literally have the school in their pocket. They can learn something anytime, anywhere. So long as they put in the effort, we'll make sure that the resources are available to them. And we're going to do more and we're going to make more announcements in the course of the year mm. up to the next budget on how we intend to step up the effort to make sure that our people stay competitive. Through your interaction and through you know, your experience as um, an ed and the education minister and as a former Labour chief as well, if you could you know, tell us um, what kind of talent you know, uh, do Singaporeans you, you think lack compared to our foreign counterparts? I always do this uh, experiment with the students that I, I meet. I say that, supposing uh, you are offered an air ticket to any part, uh, anywhere in the world, where would you go and why? Mm. Uh, many of our students are actually not afraid to travel overseas to learn. But I find something a bit lacking which is that they all tend to gravitate to the paths well-trodden. So they go to the developed countries, they go to the developed cities, uh, maybe it's uh, easier to integrate, maybe uh, the experience to them is more enriching. But I always remind myself of some of these global companies when I was at MTN and NTUC and how their HR share with me what they were looking for. The technical competencies from the Singapore students I think they pretty much take it as a given that we are very strong uh, in the basic technical competencies, mathematics, science, uh, languages and so forth. But they are looking for a few other things to try and distinguish those Singaporeans that stand out from the, uh, the rest. One is the spirit of inquiry. Are they keen to understand another <coughs> culture? Are they keen to understand another different market? Do they have the gumption to go and venture into another market, even being the first mover there, you know, go into a different market and set up operations down there. Now that requires gumption, that requires a lot of uh, uh, initiative. The second thing that I think many of the global companies look at is not just how well we work as Team Singapore with fellow Singaporeans. They will look at how we work with foreign counterparts in different markets, whether we have that um, ability to bring the whole team together with different backgrounds, uh, different cultures, different languages, and yet produce a winning team. Now those are, maybe some people call it soft skills, but mm. I don't really like that word because I think this is something that's quite tangible, a skill set that we need to equip our people. And they want to know whether you have something, what we call the unique selling point, the USP, which is why now as the education minister, I always remind ourselves, uh, my educators, our students, that. Every one of us can be unique. Every one of us can acquire that some unique characteristics that will add to the, uh, the company. Because I always start off these conversations with the students and the teachers and I ask them this question. I say, imagine you're going to uh, an interview with a potential employer. What do you think 
your potential employer will ask you first. Mm. Right? So I said, I mean, like, supposing I ask you, Rando, what, what do you think? I don't know what Straits Times asked you when you first joined. <laughs> okay, but what would a typical question be? Mm. Right? And they all always come up with this quite telling answers. They will say like, oh, why should I employ you? Right? Or what do you bring to the company? Right? I thought, yeah, those are pertinent questions. What do you bring to the company? Very few people ask you about oh, what's your PSLE score, <laughs> what's your this uh, score, because today people are looking at skill sets beyond that generic title or whether you've got a degree here and a degree there. Even for some of the people who so-called graduated in ICT, people mm -hmm. are not just interested in your generic ICT degree, they actually ask, so what did you actually do in this uh, ICT degree that is of value to my company and what can you bring that's of value to my company? So I think we need to encourage our people to start thinking in this way, that every child is unique. Our job in the education system is not so much as whether they just score well or not in a certain exam. It's whether they have the confidence to bring out that unique selling point that they can convince the potential employers to employ them. And whether they have this spirit to want to keep learning. Mm. Because I think most employers are very realistic. They don't expect you to know everything uh, when you first join. But they all want to know whether that particular Singaporean student or that particular Singaporean graduate, is he or she someone with a keen sense to learn? Because if you have a keen sense to learn, even if you don't know all the things today, you can pick it up. Yeah. But if you are just satisfied with uh, perhaps what your curriculum has covered and you have nothing above and beyond that, then the employer will find it quite hard to say that, oh, I want to take you in because you provide some unique uh, selling proposition to me and add to my company's portfolio. So that's how I will encourage our fellow Singaporeans to, to think about that. And I'm quite confident that our system will give us a strong baseline compared to many other countries. But that is in itself necessary but not sufficient. We must keep building on that baseline to scale higher peaks. And that was Education Minister Chan Chun Singh. Look out for his full interview on our YouTube channel later this evening. Thank you for tuning in to The Big Story. Visit straightstimes.com for more news and our YouTube channel for more videos. Subscribe by hitting the red button below. I'm Chao Suen and I'll see you tomorrow.